This text-to-speech conversion contains two articles about Winston Churchill. Rethinking Churchill by Ralph Rayako and The Real Churchill by Adam Young Rethinking Churchill by Ralph Rayako Churchill as Icon When, in a very few years, the pundits start to pontificate on the great question, who was the man of the century, there is little doubt that they will reach virtually instant consensus. Inevitably, the answer will be, Winston Churchill. Indeed, Professor Harry Jaffa has already informed us that Churchill was not only the man of the 20th century, but the man of many centuries. Point one. In a way, Churchill as man of the century will be appropriate. This has been the century of the state of the rise and hypertrophic growth of the welfare warfare state and Churchill was from first to last a man of the state, of the welfare state and of the warfare state. War, of course, was his lifelong passion, and, as an admiring historian has written, among his other claims to fame, Winston Churchill ranks as one of the founders of the welfare state. Thus, while Churchill never had a principle he did not in the end betray, this does not mean that there was no slant to his actions, no systematic bias. There was, and that bias was towards lowering the barriers to state power. To gain any understanding of Churchill, we must go beyond the heroic images propagated for over half a century. The conventional picture of Churchill, especially of his role in World War II, was first of all the work of Churchill himself through the distorted histories he composed and rushed into print as soon as the war was over. In more recent decades, the Churchill legend has been adopted by an internationalist establishment for which it furnishes the perfect symbol and an inexhaustible vein of high-toned blather. Churchill has become, in Christopher Hitchens's phrase, a totem of the American establishment, not only the science of the New Deal, but the neoconservative apparatus as well politicians like Newt Gingrich and Dan Quayle corporate knights and other denizens of the Reagan and Bush cabinets, the editors and writers of the Wall Street Journal, and a legion of conservative columnists led by William Sapphire and William Buckley. Churchill was, as Hitchens writes, the human bridge across which the transition was made between a non-interventionist and a globalist America. In the next century, it is not impossible that his bulldog likeness will feature in the logo of the New World Order. Let it be freely conceded that in 1940 Churchill played his role superbly. As the military historian, Major General J.F.C. Fuller, a sharp critic of Churchill's wartime policies, wrote, Churchill was a man cast in the heroic mold, a berserker ever ready to lead a forlorn hope or storm a breach, and at his best when things were at their worst. His glamorous rhetoric, his pugnacity and his insistence on annihilating the enemy appealed to human instincts, and made him an outstanding war leader. History outdid herself when she cast Churchill as the adversary in the duel with Hitler. It matters not at all that in his most famous speech we shall fight them on the beaches, we shall fight them in the fields and in the streets he plagiarized Clemenceau at the time of the Ludendorff offensive, that there was little real threat of a German invasion or, that, perhaps, there was no reason for the duel to have occurred in the first place. For a few months in 1940, Churchill played his part magnificently and unforgettably. Point seven. Opportunism and Rhetoric Yet before 1940, the word most closely associated with Churchill was opportunist. He had twice changed his party affiliation from conservative to liberal, and then back again. His move to the liberals was allegedly on the issue of free trade. But in 1930, he sold out on free trade as well, even tariffs on food and proclaimed that he had cast off Cobdenism forever. As head of the Board of Trade before World War I, he opposed increased armaments, after he became First Lord of the Admiralty in 1911, he pushed for bigger and bigger budgets, spreading wild rumors of the growing strength of the German Navy, just as he did in the 1930s about the build-up of the German Air Force. He attacked socialism before and after World War I, while during the war he promoted war socialism, calling for nationalization of the railroads, and declaring in a speech, our whole nation must be organized, must be socialized if you like the word. Churchill's opportunism continued to the end. In the 1945 election, he briefly latched onto Hayek's road to serfdom, and tried to paint the Labour Party as totalitarian, 
while it was Churchill himself who, in 1943, had accepted the beverage plans for the post-war welfare state and Keynesian management of the economy. Throughout his career his one guiding rule was to climb to power and stay there. There were two principles that for a long while seemed dear to Churchill's heart. One was anti-communism, he was an early and fervent opponent of Bolshevism. For years, he very correctly decried the bloody baboons and foul murderers of Moscow. His deep early admiration of Benito Mussolini was rooted in his shrewd appreciation of what Mussolini had accomplished, or so he thought. In an Italy teetering on the brink of Leninist revolution, I.L. Duce had discovered the one formula that could counteract the Leninist appeal, hypernationalism with a social slant. Churchill lauded Fascismo's triumphant struggle against the bestial appetites and passions of Leninism, claiming that it proved the necessary antidote to the communist poison 12. Yet the time came when Churchill made his peace with communism. In 1941, he gave unconditional support to Stalin, welcomed him as an ally, embraced him as a friend. Churchill, as well as Roosevelt, used the affectionate nickname, Uncle Joe, as late as the Potsdam Conference, he repeatedly announced, of Stalin, I like that man. In suppressing the evidence that the Polish officers at Katyn had been murdered by the Soviets, he remarked, there is no use prowling round the three-year-old graves of Smolensk. Obsessed not only with defeating Hitler, but with destroying Germany, Churchill was oblivious to the danger of a Soviet inundation of Europe until it was far too late. The climax of his infatuation came at the November, 1943, Tehran Conference, when Churchill presented Stalin with a crusader's sword. Those who are concerned to define the word obscenity may wish to ponder that episode. Finally, there was what appeared to be the abiding love of his life, the British Empire. If Churchill stood for anything at all, it was the Empire, he famously said that he had not become Prime Minister in order to preside over its liquidation. But that, of course, is precisely what he did, selling out the Empire and everything else for the sake of total victory over Germany. Besides his opportunism, Churchill was noted for his remarkable rhetorical skill. This talent helped him wield power over men, but it pointed to a fateful failing as well. Throughout his life, many who observed Churchill closely noted a peculiar trait. In 1917, Lord Esher described it in this way. He handles great subjects in rhythmical language, and becomes quickly enslaved to his own phrases. He deceives himself into the belief that he takes broad views, when his mind is fixed upon one comparatively small aspect of the question. Point 16. During World War II, Robert Menzies, who was the Prime Minister of Australia, said of Churchill, his real tyrant is the glittering phrase so attractive to his mind that awkward facts have to give way. Another associate wrote, he is, the slave of the words which his mind forms about ideas and he can convince himself of almost every truth if it is once allowed thus to start on its wild career through his rhetorical machinery 18. But while Winston had no principles, there was one constant in his life, the love of war. It began early. As a child, he had a huge collection of toy soldiers, 1,500 of them, and he played with them for many years after most boys turned to other things. They were all British, he tells us, and he fought battles with his brother Jack, who was only allowed to have colored troops, and they were not allowed to have artillery. He attended Sandhurst, the military academy, instead of the universities, and from the moment that Churchill left Sandhurst, he did his utmost to get into a fight, wherever a war was going on. All his life he was most excited on the evidence, only really excited by war. He loved war as few modern men ever have 21 he even loved the bangs, as he called them, and he was very brave under fire. In 1925, Churchill wrote, The story of the human race is war. This, however, is untrue, potentially, it is disastrously untrue. Churchill lacked any grasp of the fundamentals of the social philosophy of classical liberalism. In particular, he never understood that, as Ludwig von Mises explained, the true story of the human race is the extension of social cooperation and the division of labor. Peace, not war, is the father of all things. 
for Churchill, the years without war offered nothing to him but the bland skies of peace and platitude. This was a man, as we shall see, who wished for more wars than actually happened. When he was posted to India and began to read avidly, to make up for lost time, Churchill was profoundly impressed by Darwinism. He lost whatever religious faith he may have had through reading Gibbon, he said and took a particular dislike, for some reason, to the Catholic Church, as well as Christian missions. He became, in his own words, a materialist to the tips of my fingers, and he fervently upheld the world view that human life is a struggle for existence, with the outcome the survival of the fittest. This philosophy of life and history Churchill expressed in his one novel, Savrila. That Churchill was a racist goes without saying, yet his racism went deeper than with most of his contemporaries. It is curious how, with his stark Darwinian outlook, his elevation of war to the central place in human history, and his racism, as well as his fixation on great leaders, Churchill's worldview resembled that of his antagonist, Hitler. When Churchill was not actually engaged in war, he was reporting on it. He early made a reputation for himself as a war correspondent, in Kitchener's campaign in the Sudan and in the Boer War. In December, 1900, a dinner was given at the Waldorf Astoria in honor of the young journalist, recently returned from his well-publicized adventures in South Africa. Mark Twain, who introduced him, had already, it seems, caught on to Churchill. In a brief satirical speech, Twain slyly suggested that, with his English father and American mother, Churchill was the perfect representative of Anglo-American Kant.27. Churchill and the New Liberalism In 1900 Churchill began the career he was evidently fated for. His background the grandson of a duke and son of a famous Tory politician got him into the House of Commons as a conservative. At first he seemed to be distinguished only by his restless ambition, remarkable even in parliamentary ranks. But in 1904, he crossed the floor to the Liberals, supposedly on account of his free trade convictions. However, Robert Rhodes James, one of Churchill's admirers, wrote, It was believed at the time, probably rightly, that if Arthur Balfour had given him office in 1902, Churchill would not have developed such a burning interest in free trade and joined the Liberals. Clive Ponting notes that, as he had already admitted to Rosebery, he was looking for an excuse to defect from a party that seemed reluctant to recognize his talents, and the Liberals would not accept a protectionist. Point 28. Tossed by the tides of faddish opinion, with no principles of his own and hungry for power, Churchill soon became an adherent of the new liberalism, an updated version of his father's Tory democracy. The new liberalism differed from the old only in the small matter of substituting incessant state activism for laissez-faire. Although his conservative idolaters seem blithely unaware of the fact for them it is always 1940 Churchill was one of the chief architects of the welfare state in Britain. The modern welfare state, successor to the welfare state of 18th century absolutism, began in the 1880s in Germany, under Bismarck. In England, the legislative turning point came when Asquith succeeded Campbell Bannerman as Prime Minister in 1908. His reorganized cabinet included David Lloyd George at the Exchequer and Churchill at the Board of Trade. Of course, the electoral dimension of social policy was well to the fore in Churchill's thinking, writes a sympathetic historian meaning that Churchill understood it as the way to win votes. He wrote to a friend. No legislation at present in view interests the democracy. All their minds are turning more and more to the social and economic issue. This revolution is irresistible. They will not tolerate the existing system by which wealth is acquired, shared, and employed. They will set their faces like flint against the money power heir of all other powers and tyrannies overthrown and its obvious injustices. And this theoretical repulsion will ultimately extend to any party associated in maintaining the status quo. Minimum standards of wages and comfort, insurance in some effective form or other against sickness, unemployment, old age. These are the questions and the only questions by which parties are going to live in the future. Woe to liberalism, if they slip through its fingers.32. Churchill had already announced his conversion to a collectivist social policy before his move to the Board of Trade. 
his constant theme became the just precedence of public over private interests. He took up the fashionable social engineering clichés of the time, asserting that, science, physical and political alike, revolts at the disorganization which glares at us in so many aspects of modern life, and that the nation demands the application of drastic corrective and curative processes. The state was to acquire canals and railroads, develop certain national industries, provide vastly augmented education, introduce the eight-hour workday, levy progressive taxes, and guarantee a national minimum living standard. It is no wonder that Beatrice Webb noted that Churchill was definitely casting in his lot with the constructive state action 34. Following a visit to Germany, Lloyd George and Churchill were both converted to the Bismarckian model of social insurance schemes. As Churchill told his constituents, my heart was filled with admiration of the patient genius which had added these social bulwarks to the many glories of the German race. He set out, in his words, to thrust a big slice of Bismarckianism over the whole underside of our industrial system. In 1908, Churchill announced in a speech in Dundee, I am on the side of those who think that a greater collective sentiment should be introduced into the state and the municipalities. I should like to see the state undertaking new functions. Still, individualism must be respected, no man can be a collectivist alone or an individualist alone. He must be both an individualist and a collectivist. The nature of man is a dual nature. The character of the organization of human society is dual. This, by the way, is a good sample of Churchill as political philosopher, it never gets much better. But while both collective organization and individual incentive must be given their due, Churchill was certain which had gained the upper hand. The whole tendency of civilization is, however, towards the multiplication of the collective functions of society. The ever-growing complications of civilization create for us new services which have to be undertaken by the state, and create for us an expansion of existing services. There is a pretty steady determination, to intercept all future unearned increment which may arise from the increase in the speculative value of the land. There will be an ever-widening area of municipal enterprise. The status trend met with Churchill's complete approval. As he added, I go farther, I should like to see the state embark on various novel and adventurous experiments. I am very sorry we have not got the railways of this country in our hands. We may do something better with the canals.39. This grandson of a duke and glorifier of his ancestor, the arch-corruptionist Marlborough, was not above pandering to lower-class resentments. Churchill claimed that the cause of the Liberal Party is the cause of the left-out millions, while he attacked the Conservatives as the party of the rich against the poor, the classes and their dependence against the masses, of the lucky, the wealthy, the happy, and the strong, against the left-out and the shut-out millions of the weak and poor. Churchill became the perfect hustling political entrepreneur, eager to politicize one area of social life after the other. He berated the conservatives for lacking even a single plan of social reform or reconstruction, while boasting that he and his associates intended to propose a wide, comprehensive, interdependent scheme of social organization, incorporated in a massive series of legislative proposals and administrative acts 41. At this time, Churchill fell under the influence of Beatrice and Sidney Webb, the leaders of the Fabian Society. At one of her famous strategic dinner parties, Beatrice Webb introduced Churchill to a young protege, William later Lord Beveridge. Churchill brought Beveridge into the Board of Trade as his advisor on social questions, thus starting him on his illustrious career. Besides pushing for a variety of social insurance schemes, Churchill created the system of national labor exchanges, he wrote to Prime Minister Asquith of the need to spread, a sort of Germanized network of state intervention and regulation over the British labor market. But Churchill entertained much more ambitious goals for the Board of Trade. He proposed a plan whereby the Board of Trade was to act as the intelligence department of the government, forecasting trade and employment in the regions so that the government could allocate contracts to the most deserving areas. At the summit, would be a committee of national organization, chaired by the Chancellor of the Exchequer to supervise the economy. Point 44. Finally, well aware of the electoral potential of organized labor, 
Churchill became a champion of the labor unions. He was a leading supporter, for instance, of the Trades Disputes Act of 1906. This act reversed the Taft Veil and other judicial decisions, which had held unions responsible for torts and wrongs committed on their behalf by their agents. The act outraged the great liberal legal historian and theorist of the rule of law, A. V. Dicey, who charged that it confers upon a trade union a freedom from civil liability for the commission of even the most heinous wrong by the union or its servants, and in short confers upon every trade union a privilege and protection not possessed by any other person or body of persons, whether corporate or unincorporate, throughout the United Kingdom. It makes a trade union a privileged body exempted from the ordinary law of the land. No such privileged body has ever before been deliberately created by an English Parliament. Point 46. It is ironic that the immense power of the British labor unions, the Betonoir of Margaret Thatcher, was brought into being with the enthusiastic help of her great hero, Winston Churchill. World War I. In 1911, Churchill became First Lord of the Admiralty, and now was truly in his element. Naturally, he quickly allied himself with the war party, and, during the crises that followed, fanned the flames of war. When the final crisis came, in the summer of 1914, Churchill was the only member of the cabinet who backed war from the start, with all of his accustomed energy. Asquith, his own prime minister, wrote of him, Winston very bellicose and demanding immediate mobilization. Winston, who has got all his war paint on, is longing for a sea fight in the early hours of the morning to result in the sinking of the Goban. The whole thing fills me with sadness 47. On the afternoon of July 28, three days before the German invasion of Belgium, he mobilized the British home fleet, the greatest assemblage of naval power in the history of the world to that time. As Sidney Fay wrote, Churchill ordered that. The fleet was to proceed during the night at high speed and without lights through the Straits of Dover from Portland to its fighting base at Scapa Flow. Fearing to bring this order before the cabinet, lest it should be considered a provocative action likely to damage the chances of peace, Mr. Churchill had only informed Mr. Asquith, who at once gave his approval. Point 48. No wonder that, when war with Germany broke out, Churchill, in contrast even to the other chiefs of the war party, was all smiles, filled with a glowing zest 49. From the outset of hostilities, Churchill, as head of the Admiralty, was instrumental in establishing the hunger blockade of Germany. This was probably the most effective weapon employed on either side in the whole conflict. The only problem was that, according to everyone's interpretation of international law except Britain's, it was illegal. The blockade was not close in, but depended on scattering mines, and many of the goods deemed contraband for instance, food for civilians had never been so classified before. But, throughout his career, international law and the conventions by which men have tried to limit the horrors of war meant nothing to Churchill. As a German historian has dryly commented, Churchill was ready to break the rules whenever the very existence of his country was at stake, and for him this was very often the case. 51. The hunger blockade had certain rather unpleasant consequences. About 750,000 German civilians succumbed to hunger and diseases caused by malnutrition. The effect on those who survived was perhaps just as frightful in its own way. A historian of the blockade concluded, the victimized youth of World War I were to become the most radical adherents of National Socialism. It was also complications arising from the British blockade that eventually provided the pretext for Wilson's decision to go to war in 1917. Whether Churchill actually arranged for the sinking of the Lusitania on May 7, 1915, is still unclear. A week before the disaster, he wrote to Walter Runciman, president of the Board of Trade that it was most important to attract neutral shipping to our shores, in the hopes especially of embroiling the United States with Germany. Many highly placed persons in Britain and America believed that the German sinking of the Lusitania would bring the United States into the war. The most recent student of the subject is Patrick Beasley, whose Room 40 is a history of British naval intelligence in World War I. Beasley's careful account is all the more persuasive for going against the grain of his own sentiments. 
he points out that the British Admiralty was aware that German U-boat command had informed U-boat captains at sea of the sailings of the Lusitania, and that the U-boat responsible for the sinking of two ships in recent days was present in the vicinity of Queenstown, off the southern coast of Ireland, in the path the Lusitania was scheduled to take. There is no surviving record of any specific warning to the Lusitania. No destroyer escort was sent to accompany the ship to port, nor were any of the readily available destroyers instructed to hunt for the submarine. In fact, no effective steps were taken to protect the Lusitania. Beasley concludes. Unless and until fresh information comes to light, I am reluctantly driven to the conclusion that there was a conspiracy deliberately to put the Lusitania at risk in the hope that even an abortive attack on her would bring the United States into the war. Such a conspiracy could not have been put into effect without Winston Churchill's express permission and approval. 55. In any case, what is certain is that Churchill's policies made the sinking very likely. The Lusitania was a passenger liner loaded with munitions of war. Churchill had given orders to the captains of merchant ships, including liners, to ram German submarines if they encountered them, and the Germans were aware of this. And, as Churchill stressed in his memoirs of World War I, embroiling neutral countries in hostilities with the enemy was a crucial part of warfare, there are many kinds of maneuvers in war, some only of which take place on the battlefield. The maneuver which brings an ally into the field is as serviceable as that which wins a great battle 56. In the midst of bloody conflict, Churchill was energy personified, the source of one brainstorm after another. Sometimes his hunches worked out well he was the chief promoter of the tank in World War I sometimes not so well, as at Gallipoli. The notoriety of that disaster, which blackened his name for years, caused him to be temporarily dropped from the cabinet in 1915. His reaction was typical, to one visitor, he said, pointing to the maps on the wall, this is what I live for. Yes, I am finished in respect of all I care for the waging of war, the defeat of the Germans 58. Between the wars. For the next few years, Churchill was shuttled from one ministerial post to another. As Minister of War of Churchill in this position one may say what the revisionist historian Charles Tansill said of Henry Stimson as Secretary of War, no one ever deserved the title more Churchill promoted a crusade to crush Bolshevism in Russia. As colonial secretary, he was ready to involve Britain in war with Turkey over the Chinak incident, but the British envoy to Turkey did not deliver Churchill's ultimatum, and in the end cooler heads prevailed. 59. In 1924, Churchill rejoined the Conservatives and was made Chancellor of the Exchequer. His father, in the same office, was noted for having been puzzled by the decimals, what were those damned dots? Winston's most famous act was to return Britain to the gold standard at the unrealistic pre-war parity, thus severely damaging the export trade and ruining the good name of gold, as was pointed out by Murray N. Rothbard. Hardly anyone today would disagree with the judgment of A.J.P. Taylor. Churchill did not grasp the economic arguments one way or the other. What determined him was again a devotion to British greatness. The pound would once more look the dollar in the face, the days of Queen Victoria would be restored 61. So far Churchill had been engaged in politics for 30 years, with not much to show for it except a certain notoriety. His great claim to fame in the modern mythology begins with his hard line against Hitler in the 1930s. But it is important to realize that Churchill had maintained a hard line against Weimar Germany, as well. He denounced all calls for Allied disarmament, even before Hitler came to power. Like other Allied leaders, Churchill was living a protracted fantasy, that Germany would submit forever to what it viewed as the shackles of Versailles. In the end, what Britain and France refused to grant to a democratic Germany they were forced to concede to Hitler. Moreover, if most did not bother to listen when Churchill fulminated on the impending German threat, they had good reason. He had tried to whip up hysteria too often before, for a crusade against Bolshevik Russia, during the general strike of 1926, on the mortal dangers of Indian independence, in the abdication crisis. Why pay any heed to his latest delusion, 63? Churchill had been a strong Zionist practically from the start, 
holding that Zionism would deflect European Jews from social revolution to partnership with European imperialism in the Arab world. Now, in 1936, he forged links with the informal London pressure group known as the Focus, whose purpose was to open the eyes of the British public to the one great menace, Nazi Germany. The great bulk of its finance came from rich British Jews such as Sir Robert Mond, a director of several chemical firms, and Sir Robert Whaley Cohn, the managing director of Shell, the latter contributing pound 50, 000. The focus was to be useful in expanding Churchill's network of contacts and in pushing for his entry into the cabinet. Point 65. Though a conservative MP, Churchill began berating the conservative governments, first Baldwin's and then Chamberlain's, for their alleged blindness to the Nazi threat. He vastly exaggerated the extent of German rearmament, formidable as it was, and distorted its purpose by harping on German production of heavy bombers. This was never a German priority, and Churchill's fabrications were meant to demonstrate a German design to attack Britain, which was never Hitler's intention. At this time, Churchill busily promoted the Grand Alliance that was to include Britain, France, Russia, Poland and Czechoslovakia. Since the Poles, having nearly been conquered by the Red Army in 1920, rejected any coalition with the Soviet Union, and since the Soviets' only access to Germany was through Poland, Churchill's plan was worthless. Ironically considering that it was a pillar of his future fame his drumbeating about the German danger was yet another position on which Churchill reneged. In the fall of 1937, he stated, Three or four years ago I was myself a loud alarmist. In spite of the risks which wait on prophecy, I declare my belief that a major war is not imminent, and I still believe that there is a good chance of no major war taking place in our lifetime. I will not pretend that, if I had to choose between communism and Nazism, I would choose communism. Point 67. For all the claptrap about Churchill's far-sightedness during the 30s in opposing the appeasers, in the end the policy of the Chamberlain government to rearm as quickly as possible, while testing the chances for peace with Germany was more realistic than Churchill's. The common mythology is so far from historical truth that even an ardent Churchill sympathizer, Gordon Craig, feels obliged to write. The time is long past when it was possible to see the protracted debate over British foreign policy in the 1930s as a struggle between Churchill, an angel of light, fighting against the velleities of uncomprehending and feeble men in high places. It is reasonably well known today that Churchill was often ill-informed, that his claims about German strength were exaggerated and his prescriptions impractical, that his emphasis on air power was misplaced. Point 68. Moreover, as a British historian has recently noted, for the record, it is worth recalling that in the 1930s Churchill did not oppose the appeasement of either Italy or Japan. It is also worth recalling that it was the pre-Churchill British governments that furnished the material with which Churchill was able to win the Battle of Britain. Clive Ponting has observed. The Baldwin and Chamberlain governments, had ensured that Britain was the first country in the world to deploy a fully integrated system of air defence based on radar detection of incoming aircraft and ground control of fighters. Churchill's contribution had been to pour scorn on radar when he was in opposition in the 1930s.70. Embroiling America in War Again In September, 1939, Britain went to war with Germany, pursuant to the guarantee which Chamberlain had been panicked into extending to Poland in March. Lloyd George had termed the guarantee hair-brained, while Churchill had supported it. Nonetheless, in his history of the war Churchill wrote, here was decision at last, taken at the worst possible moment and on the least satisfactory ground which must surely lead to the slaughter of tens of millions of people. With the war on, Winston was recalled to his old job as First Lord of the Admiralty. Then, in the first month of the war, an astonishing thing happened, the President of the United States initiated a personal correspondence not with the Prime Minister, but with the head of the British Admiralty, bypassing all the ordinary diplomatic channels. Point 72. The messages that passed between the President and the First Lord were surrounded by a frantic secrecy, culminating in the affair of Tyler Kent, the American cipher clerk at the U.S. London Embassy who was tried and imprisoned by the British authorities. 
The problem was that some of the messages contained allusions to Roosevelt's agreement even before the war began to a blatantly unneutral cooperation with a belligerent Britain. 73. On June 10, 1939, George VI and his wife, Queen Mary, visited the Roosevelts at Hyde Park. In private conversations with the King, Roosevelt promised full support for Britain in case of war. He intended to set up a zone in the Atlantic to be patrolled by the U.S. Navy, and, according to the King's notes, the President stated that if he saw a U-boat he would sink her at once and wait for the consequences. The biographer of George VI, Wheeler Bennett, considered that these conversations contained the germ of the future basis for destroyers deal, and also of the Lend-Lease Agreement itself. In communicating with the First Lord of the Admiralty, Roosevelt was aware that he was in touch with the one member of Chamberlain's cabinet whose belligerence matched his own. In 1940, Churchill at last became Prime Minister, ironically enough when the Chamberlain government resigned because of the Norwegian fiasco which Churchill, more than anyone else, had helped to bring about. As he had fought against a negotiated peace after the fall of Poland, so he continued to resist any suggestion of negotiations with Hitler. Many of the relevant documents are still sealed after all these years 76 but it is clear that a strong peace party existed in the country and the government. It included Lloyd George in the House of Commons, and Halifax, the Foreign Secretary, in the Cabinet. Even after the fall of France, Churchill rejected Hitler's renewed peace overtures. This, more than anything else, is supposed to be the foundation of his greatness. The British historian John Charmiley raised a storm of outraged protest when he suggested that a negotiated peace in 1940 might have been to the advantage of Britain and Europe. A Yale historian, writing in the New York Times Book Review, referred to Charmley's thesis as morally sickening. Yet Charmley's scholarly and detailed work makes the crucial point that Churchill's adamant refusal even to listen to peace terms in 1940 doomed what he claimed was dearest to him the empire and a Britain that was non-socialist and independent in world affairs. One may add that it probably also doomed European Jewry. It is amazing that half a century after the fact, there are critical theses concerning World War II that are off-limits to historical debate. Lloyd George, Halifax, and the others were open to a compromise peace because they understood that Britain and the Dominions alone could not defeat Germany. After the fall of France, Churchill's aim of total victory could be realized only under one condition, that the United States become embroiled in another world war. No wonder that Churchill put his heart and soul into ensuring precisely that. After a talk with Churchill, Joseph Kennedy, American ambassador to Britain, noted, every hour will be spent by the British in trying to figure out how we can be gotten in. When he left from Lisbon on a ship to New York, Kennedy pleaded with the State Department to announce that if the ship should happen to blow up mysteriously in the mid-Atlantic, the United States would not consider it a cause for war with Germany. In his unpublished memoirs, Kennedy wrote, I thought that would give me some protection against Churchill's placing a bomb on the ship 81. Kennedy's fears were perhaps not exaggerated. For, while it had been important for British policy in World War I, involving America was the sine qua non of Churchill's policy in World War II. In Franklin Roosevelt, he found a ready accomplice. That Roosevelt, through his actions and private words, evinced a clear design for war before December 7, 1941, has never really been in dispute. Arguments have raged over such questions as his possible foreknowledge of the Pearl Harbor attack. In 1948, Thomas A. Bailey, diplomatic historian at Stanford, already put the real pro-Roosevelt case. Franklin Roosevelt repeatedly deceived the American people during the period before Pearl Harbor. He was like a physician who must tell the patient lies for the patient's own good. The country was overwhelmingly non-interventionist to the very day of Pearl Harbor, and an overt attempt to lead the people into war would have resulted in certain failure and an almost certain ousting of Roosevelt in 1940, with the complete defeat of his ultimate aims. 82. Churchill himself never bothered to conceal Roosevelt's role as CO conspirator. In January, 1941, Harry Hopkins visited London. Churchill described him as the most faithful and perfect channel of communication between the President and me the main prop and animator of Roosevelt himself. 
I soon comprehended Hopkins's personal dynamism and the outstanding importance of his mission, here was an envoy from the President of supreme importance to our life. With gleaming eye and quiet, constrained passion he said, the President is determined that we shall win the war together. Make no mistake about it. He has sent me here to tell you that all costs and by all means he will carry you through, no matter what happens to him there is nothing that he will not do so far as he has human power. There he sat, slim, frail, ill, but absolutely glowing with refined comprehension of the cause. It was to be the defeat, ruin, and slaughter of Hitler, to the exclusion of all other purposes, loyalties and aims. Point 83. In 1976, the public finally learned the story of William Stevenson, the British agent code named Intrepid, sent by Churchill to the United States in 1940. Stevenson set up headquarters in Rockefeller Center, with orders to use any means necessary to help bring the United States into the war. With the full knowledge and cooperation of Roosevelt and the collaboration of federal agencies, Stevenson and his 300 or so agents intercepted mail, tapped wires, cracked safes, kidnapped, rumor-mongered and incessantly smeared their favorite targets, the isolationists. Through Stevenson, Churchill was virtually in control of William Donovan's organization, the embryonic U.S. Intelligence Service. 85. Churchill even had a hand in the barrage of pro-British, anti-German propaganda that issued from Hollywood in the years before the United States entered the war. Gore Vital, in Screening History, perceptively notes that starting around 1937, Americans were subjected to one film after another glorifying England and the warrior heroes who built the empire. As spectators of these productions, Vital says, we served neither Lincoln nor Jefferson Davis, we served the crown. A key Hollywood figure in generating the movies that were making us all weirdly English was the Hungarian émigré and friend of Churchill, Alexander Korda. Vital very aptly writes, For those who find disagreeable today's Zionist propaganda, I can only say that gallant little Israel of today must have learned a great deal from the gallant little Englanders of the 1930s. The English kept up a propaganda barrage that was to permeate our entire culture. Hollywood was subtly and not so subtly infiltrated by British propagandists. 88. While the Americans were being worked on, the two Confederates consulted on how to arrange for direct hostilities between the United States and Germany. In August, 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill met at the Atlantic Conference. Here they produced the Atlantic Charter, with its four freedoms, including the freedom from want a blank check to spread Anglo-American social politique around the globe. When Churchill returned to London, he informed the cabinet of what had been agreed to. Thirty years later, the British documents were released. Here is how the New York Times reported the revelations. Formerly top-secret British government papers made public today said that President Franklin D. Roosevelt told Prime Minister Winston Churchill in August, 1941, that he was looking for an incident to justify opening hostilities against Nazi Germany. On August 19 Churchill reported to the War Cabinet in London on other aspects of the Newfoundland Atlantic Charter meeting that were not made public. He Roosevelt obviously was determined that they should come in. If he were to put the issue of peace and war to Congress, they would debate it for months, the cabinet minutes added. The president had said he would wage war but not declare it and that he would become more and more provocative. If the Germans did not like it, they could attack American forces. Everything was to be done to force an incident 89. On July 15, 1941, Admiral Little, of the British naval delegation in Washington, wrote to Admiral Pound, the first sea lord, the brightest hope for getting America into the war lies in the escorting arrangements to Iceland, and let us hope the Germans will not be slow in attacking them. Little added, perhaps jokingly, otherwise I think it would be best for us to organize an attack by our own submarines and preferably on the escort. A few weeks earlier, Churchill, looking for a chance to bring America into the war, wrote to Pound regarding the German warship, Prince Eugen, it would be better for instance that she should be located by a U.S. ship as this might tempt her to fire on that ship, thus providing the incident for which the U.S. government would be so grateful. Incidents in the North Atlantic did occur, 
increasingly, as the United States approached war with Germany. 91. But Churchill did not neglect the back door to war embroiling the United States with Japan as a way of bringing America into the conflict with Hitler. Sir Robert Craigie, the British ambassador to Tokyo, like the American ambassador Joseph Grew, was working feverishly to avoid war. Churchill directed his foreign secretary, Anthony Eden, to whip Craigie into line. He should surely be told forthwith that the entry of the United States into war either with Germany and Italy or with Japan, is fully conformable with British interests. Nothing in the munitions sphere can compare with the importance of the British Empire and the United States being CO belligerent. 92. Churchill threw his influence into the balance to harden American policy towards Japan, especially in the last days before the Pearl Harbor attack. A sympathetic critic of Churchill, Richard Lamb, has recently written. Was Churchill justified in trying to provoke Japan to attack the United States? In 1941 Britain had no prospect of defeating Germany without the aid of the USA as an active ally Churchill believed Congress would never authorize Roosevelt to declare war on Germany. In war, decisions by national leaders must be made according to their effect on the war effort. There is truth in the old adage, all's fair in love and war 94. No wonder that, in the House of Commons, on February 15, 1942, Churchill declared, of America's entry into the war, this is what I have dreamed of, aimed at, worked for, and now it has come to pass 95. Churchill's devotees by no means hold his role in bringing America into World War II against him. On the contrary, they count it in his favor. Harry Jaffa, in his uninformed and frantic apology, seems to be the last person alive who refuses to believe that the man of many centuries was responsible to any degree for America's entry into the war, after all, wasn't it the Japanese who bombed Pearl Harbor, 96? But what of the American Republic? What does it mean for us that a president collaborated with a foreign head of government to entangle us in a world war? The question would have mattered little to Churchill. He had no concern with the United States as a sovereign, independent nation, with its own character and place in the scheme of things. For him, Americans were one of the English-speaking peoples. He looked forward to a common citizenship for Britons and Americans, a mixing together, on the road to Anglo-American world hegemony. 97. But the Churchill-Roosevelt intrigue should, one might think, matter to Americans. Here, however, criticism is halted before it starts. A moral postulate of our time is that in pursuit of the destruction of Hitler, all things were permissible. Yet why is it self-evident that morality required a crusade against Hitler in 1939 and 1940, and not against Stalin? At that point, Hitler had slain his thousands, but Stalin had already slain his millions. In fact, up to June, 1941, the Soviets behaved far more murderously toward the Poles in their zone of occupation than the Nazis did in theirs. Around 1,500,000 Poles were deported to the Gulag, with about half of them dying within the first two years. As Norman Davies writes, Stalin was outpacing Hitler in his desire to reduce the Poles to the condition of a slave nation. Of course, there were balance of power considerations that created distinctions between the two dictators. But it has yet to be explained why there should exist a double standard ordaining that compromise with one dictator would have been morally sickening, while collaboration with the other was morally irreproachable. 99. First catch your hair. Early in the war, Churchill, declared, I have only one aim in life, the defeat of Hitler, and this makes things very simple for me. Victory victory at all costs, understood literally, was his policy practically to the end. This points to Churchill's fundamental and fatal mistake in World War II, his separation of operational from political strategy. To the first the planning and direction of military campaigns he devoted all of his time and energy, after all, he did so enjoy it. To the second, the fitting of military operations to the larger and much more significant political aims they were supposed to serve, he devoted no effort at all. Stalin, on the other hand, understood perfectly that the entire purpose of war is to enforce certain political claims. 
This is the meaning of Clausewitz's famous dictum that war is the continuation of policy by other means. On Eden's visit to Moscow in December, 1941, with the Wehrmacht in the Moscow suburbs, Stalin was ready with his demands, British recognition of Soviet rule over the Baltic states and the territories he had just seized from Finland, Poland, and Romania. They were eventually granted. Throughout the war he never lost sight of these and other crucial political goals. But Churchill, despite frequent prodding from Eden, never gave a thought to his, whatever they might be. His approach, he explained, was that of Mrs. Glass's recipe for jugged hair, first catch your hair. First beat Hitler, then start thinking of the future of Britain and Europe. Churchill put in so many words, the defeat, ruin, and slaughter of Hitler, to the exclusion of all other purposes, loyalties, and aims. Tovia Ben Mosh has shrewdly pinpointed one of the sources of this grotesque indifference. Thirty years earlier, Churchill had told Asquith that, his life's ambition was to command great victorious armies in battle. During World War II he was determined to take nothing less than full advantage of the opportunity given him the almost unhampered military management of the great conflict. He was prone to ignore or postpone the treatment of matters likely to detract from that pleasure. In so doing, he deferred, or even shelved altogether, treatment of the issues that he should have dealt with in his capacity as Prime Minister. 103. Churchill's policy of all-out support of Stalin foreclosed other, potentially more favorable approaches. The military expert Hansen Baldwin, for instance, stated. There is no doubt whatsoever that it would have been in the interest of Britain, the United States, and the world to have allowed and indeed, to have encouraged the world's two great dictatorships to fight each other to a frazzle. Such a struggle, with its resultant weakening of both communism and Nazism, could not but have aided in the establishment of a more stable peace. 104. Instead of adopting this approach, or, for example, promoting the overthrow of Hitler by anti-Nazi Germans instead of even considering such alternatives Churchill from the start threw all of his support to Soviet Russia. Franklin Roosevelt's fatuousness towards Joseph Stalin is well known. He looked on Stalin as a fellow progressive and an invaluable collaborator in creating the future New World Order. But the neoconservatives and others who counterpose to Roosevelt's inanity in this matter Churchill's old world cunning and sagacity are sadly in error. Roosevelt's nauseating flattery of Stalin is easily matched by Churchill's. Just like Roosevelt, Churchill heaped fulsome praise on the communist murderer, and was anxious for Stalin's personal friendship. Moreover, his adulation of Stalin and his version of communism so different from the repellent Trotskyite kind was no different in private than in public. In January, 1944, he was still speaking to Eden of the deep-seated changes which have taken place in the character of the Russian state and government, the new confidence which has grown in our hearts towards Stalin. In a letter to his wife, Clementine, Churchill wrote, following the October, 1944 conference in Moscow, I have had very nice talks with the old bear. I like him the more I see him. Now they respect us and I am sure they wish to work with us. Writers like Isaiah Berlin, who try to give the impression that Churchill hated or despised all dictators, including Stalin, are either ignorant or dishonest. 108. Churchill's supporters often claim that, unlike the Americans, the seasoned and crafty British statesmen foresaw the danger from the Soviet Union and worked doggedly to thwart it. Churchill's famous Mediterranean strategy to attack Europe through its soft underbelly, rather than concentrating on an invasion of northern France is supposed to be the proof of this. But this was an ex post facto defense, concocted by Churchill once the Cold War had started, there is little, if any, contemporary evidence that the desire to beat the Russians to Vienna and Budapest formed any part of Churchill's motivation in advocating the soft underbelly strategy. At the time, Churchill gave purely military reasons for it. As Ben Mosh states, the official British historians have ascertained that not until the second half of 1944 and after the Channel Crossing did Churchill first begin to consider preempting the Russians in southeastern Europe by military means. By then, such a move would have been impossible for several reasons. It was another of Churchill's bizarre military notions, like invading fortress Europe through Norway, 
or putting off the invasion of northern France until 1945 by which time the Russians would have reached the Rhine.112. Moreover, the American opposition to Churchill's southern strategy did not stem from blindness to the communist danger. As General Albert C. Wedemeyer, one of the firmest anti-communists in the American military, wrote. If we had invaded the Balkans through the Ljubljana Gap, we might theoretically have beaten the Russians to Vienna and Budapest. But logistics would have been against us there, it would have been next to impossible to supply more than two divisions through the Adriatic ports. The proposal to save the Balkans from communism could never have been made good by a soft underbelly invasion, for Churchill himself had already cleared the way for the success of Tito, who had been firmly ensconced in Yugoslavia with British aid long before Italy itself was conquered. 113. Wedemeyer's remarks about Yugoslavia were on the mark. On this issue, Churchill rejected the advice of his own foreign office, depending instead on information provided especially by the head of the Cairo office of the SO the special operations branch headed by a communist agent named James Klugman. Churchill withdrew British support from the Loyalist guerrilla army of General Mihai Lovic and threw it to the communist partisan leader Tito. What a victory for Tito would mean was no secret to Churchill. When Fitzroy Maclean was interviewed by Churchill before being sent as liaison to Tito, Maclean observed that, under communist leadership, the partisans. Ultimate aim would undoubtedly be to establish in Yugoslavia a communist regime closely linked to Moscow. How did His Majesty's government view such an eventuality? Mr. Churchill's reply left me in no doubt as to the answer to my problem. So long, he said, as the whole of Western civilization was threatened by the Nazi menace, we could not afford to let our attention be diverted from the immediate issue by considerations of long-term policy. Politics must be a secondary consideration. 116. It would be difficult to think of a more frivolous attitude to waging war than considering politics to be a secondary consideration. As for the human costs of Churchill's policy, when an aide pointed out that Tito intended to transform Yugoslavia into a communist dictatorship on the Soviet model, Churchill retorted, Do you intend to live there? 117. Churchill's benign view of Stalin and Russia contrasts sharply with his view of Germany. Behind Hitler, Churchill discerned the old specter of Prussianism, which had caused, allegedly, not only the two world wars, but the Franco-Prussian War as well. What he was battling now was Nazi tyranny and Prussian militarism, the two main elements in German life which must be absolutely destroyed. In October, 1944, Churchill was still explaining to Stalin that, the problem was how to prevent Germany getting on her feet in the lifetime of our grandchildren. Churchill harbored a confusion of mind on the subject of the Prussian aristocracy, Nazism, and the sources of German militarist expansionism. His view was remarkably similar to that entertained by Sir Robert Van Siddert and Sir Warren Fisher, that is to say, it arose from a combination of almost racialist antipathy and balance of power calculations. Churchill's aim was not simply to save world civilization from the Nazis, but, in his words, the indefinite prevention of there the Germans rising again as an armed power 121. Little wonder, then, that Churchill refused even to listen to the pleas of the anti-Hitler German opposition, which tried repeatedly to establish liaison with the British government. Instead of making every effort to encourage and assist an anti-Nazi coup in Germany, Churchill responded to the feelers sent out by the German resistance with cold silence. Reiterated warnings from Adam von Trott and other resistance leaders of the impending Bolshevization of Europe made no impression at all on Churchill. A recent historian has written, by his intransigence and refusal to countenance talks with dissident Germans, Churchill threw away an opportunity to end the war in July 1944. To add infamy to stupidity, Churchill and his crowd had only words of scorn for the valiant German officers even as they were being slaughtered by the Gestapo. 125. In place of help, all Churchill offered Germans looking for a way to end the war before the Red Army flooded into Central Europe was the slogan of unconditional surrender. Afterwards, Churchill lied in the House of Commons about his role at Casablanca in connection with Roosevelt's announcement of the policy of unconditional surrender, and was forced to retract his statements. Eisenhower, among others, 
strenuously and persistently objected to the unconditional surrender formula as hampering the war effort by raising the morale of the Wehrmacht. In fact, the slogan was seized on by Goebbels, and contributed to the Germans holding out to the bitter end. The pernicious effect of the policy was immeasurably bolstered by the Morgenthau Plan, which gave the Germans a terrifying picture of what unconditional surrender would mean. This plan, initialed by Roosevelt and Churchill at Quebec, called for turning Germany into an agricultural and pastoral country, even the coal mines of the Ruhr were to be wrecked. The fact that it would have led to the deaths of tens of millions of Germans made it a perfect analogue to Hitler's schemes for dealing with Russia and the Ukraine. Churchill was initially averse to the plan. However, he was won over by Professor Lindemann, as maniacal a German hater as Morgenthau himself. Lindemann stated to Lord Moran, Churchill's personal physician, I explained to Winston that the plan would save Britain from bankruptcy by eliminating a dangerous competitor. Winston had not thought of it in that way, and he said no more about a cruel threat to the German people. According to Morgenthau, the wording of the scheme was drafted entirely by Churchill. When Roosevelt returned to Washington, Hull and Stimson expressed their horror, and quickly disabused the president. Churchill, on the other hand, was unrepentant. When it came time to mention the Morgenthau plan in his history of the war, he distorted its provisions and, by implication, lied about his role in supporting it. Point 130. Beyond the issue of the plan itself, Lord Moran wondered how it had been possible for Churchill to appear at the Quebec conference without any thought-out views on the future of Germany, although she seemed to be on the point of surrender. The answer was that he had become so engrossed in the conduct of the war that little time was left to plan for the future. Military detail had long fascinated him, while he was frankly bored by the kind of problem which might take up the time of the peace conference. The PM was frittering away his waning strength on matters which rightly belonged to soldiers. My diary in the autumn of 1942 tells how I talked to Sir Stafford Cripps and found that he shared my cares. He wanted the PM to concentrate on the broad strategy of the war and on high policy. No one could make Churchill see his errors. 131. War Crimes Discreetly Veiled There are a number of episodes during the war revealing of Churchill's character that deserve to be mentioned. A relatively minor incident was the British attack on the French fleet, at Mers el Kabir, Oran, off the coast of Algeria. After the fall of France, Churchill demanded that the French surrender their fleet to Britain. The French declined, promising that they would scuttle the ships before allowing them to fall into German hands. Against the advice of his naval officers, Churchill ordered British ships off the Algerian coast to open fire. About 1,500 French sailors were killed. This was obviously a war crime, by anyone's definition, an unprovoked attack on the forces of an ally without a declaration of war. At Nuremberg, German officers were sentenced to prison for less. Realizing this, Churchill lied about Mers el Kabir in his history, and suppressed evidence concerning it in the official British histories of the war. With the attack on the French fleet, Churchill confirmed his position as the prime subverter through two world wars of the system of rules of warfare that had evolved in the West over centuries. But the great war crime which will be forever linked to Churchill's name is the terror bombing of the cities of Germany that in the end cost the lives of around 600,000 civilians and left some 800,000 seriously injured. Compare this to the roughly 70,000 British lives lost to German air attacks. In fact, there were nearly as many Frenchmen killed by Allied air attacks as there were Englishmen killed by Germans. 134. The plan was conceived mainly by Churchill's friend and scientific adviser, Professor Lindemann, and carried out by the head of Bomber Command, Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris. Harris stated, in Bomber Command we have always worked on the assumption that bombing anything in Germany is better than bombing nothing. Harris and other British Air Force leaders boasted that Britain had been the pioneer in the massive use of strategic bombing. J.M. Spate, former Principal Assistant Secretary of the Air Ministry, noted that while the Germans, and the French, looked on air power as largely an extension of artillery, a support to the armies in the field, the British understood its capacity to destroy the enemy's home base. They built their bombers and established Bomber Command accordingly. 136. 
brazenly lying to the House of Commons and the public, Churchill claimed that only military and industrial installations were targeted. In fact, the aim was to kill as many civilians as possible thus, area bombing, or carpet bombing and in this way to break the morale of the Germans and terrorize them into surrendering. 137. Harris at least had the courage of his convictions. He urged that the government openly announce that the aim of the combined bomber offensive, should be unambiguously stated as the destruction of German cities, the killing of German workers, and the disruption of civilized life throughout Germany. 138. The campaign of murder from the air leveled Germany. A thousand year old urban culture was annihilated, as great cities, famed in the annals of science and art, were reduced to heaps of smoldering ruins. There were high points, the bombing of Lübeck, when that ancient Hansa attic town burned like kindling the 1,000 bomber raid over Cologne, and the following raids that somehow, miraculously, mostly spared the great cathedral but destroyed the rest of the city, including 13 Romanesque churches, the firestorm that consumed Hamburg and killed some 42,000 people. No wonder that, learning of this, a civilized European man like Joseph Schumpeter, at Harvard, was driven to telling anyone who would listen that Churchill and Roosevelt were destroying more than Genghis Khan. 139. The most infamous act was the destruction of Dresden, in February, 1945. According to the official history of the Royal Air Force, the destruction of Germany was by then on a scale which might have appalled Attila or Genghis Khan. Dresden, which was the capital of the Old Kingdom of Saxony, was an indispensable stop on the Grand Tour the Baroque gem of Europe. The war was practically over, the city filled with masses of helpless refugees escaping the advancing Red Army. Still, for three days and nights, from February 13 to 15, Dresden was pounded with bombs. At least 30,000 people were killed, perhaps as many as 135,000 or more. The Zwinger Palace, Our Lady's Church, Die Frauenkirche, the Brühl Terrace, Overlooking the Elbe where, in Turgenev's fathers and sons, Uncle Pavel went to spend his last years, the Semper Opera House, where Richard Strauss conducted the premiere of Rosenkavalier, and practically everything else was incinerated. Churchill had fomented it. But he was shaken by the outcry that followed. While in Georgetown and Hollywood, few had ever heard of Dresden, the city meant something in Stockholm, Zurich and the Vatican, and even in London. What did our hero do? He sent a memorandum to the chiefs of staff. It seems to me that the moment has come when the question of bombing of German cities simply for the sake of increasing the terror, though under other pretexts, should be reviewed. Otherwise, we shall come into control of an utterly ruined land. The destruction of Dresden remains a serious query against the conduct of Allied bombing. I feel the need for more precise concentration upon military objectives rather than on mere acts of terror and wanton destruction, however impressive. 141. The military chiefs saw through Churchill's contemptible ploy, realizing that they were being set up, they refused to accept the memorandum. After the war, Churchill casually disclaimed any knowledge of the Dresden bombing, saying, I thought the Americans did it 142. And still the bombing continued. On March 16, in a period of 20 minutes, Würzburg was razed to the ground. As late as the middle of April, Berlin and Potsdam were bombed yet again, killing another 5,000 civilians. Finally, it stopped, as bomber Harris noted, there were essentially no more targets to be bombed in Germany. It need hardly be recorded that Churchill supported the atom bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which resulted in the deaths of another 100,000, or more, civilians. When Truman fabricated the myth of the 500,000 U.S. lives saved by avoiding an invasion of the home islands the highest military estimate had been 46,000 Churchill topped his lie, the atom bombings had saved 1,200,000 lives, including 1 million Americans, he fantasized. 144. The eagerness with which Churchill directed or applauded the destruction of cities from the air should raise questions for those who still consider him the great conservative of his or perhaps of all time. They would do well to consider the judgment of an authentic conservative like Eric von Kienelt-Leden, who wrote, 
non-Britishers did not matter to Mr. Churchill, who sacrificed human beings their lives, their welfare, their liberty with the same elegant disdain as his colleague in the White House. 1945, The Dark Side And so we come to 1945 and the ever-radiant triumph of absolute good over absolute evil. So potent is the mystique of that year that the insipid welfare states of today's Europe clutch at it at every opportunity, in search of a few much-needed shreds of glory. The dark side of that triumph, however, has been all but suppressed. It is the story of the crimes and atrocities of the victors and their protégés. Since Winston Churchill played a central role in the Allied victory, it is the story also of the crimes and atrocities in which Churchill was implicated. These include the forced repatriation of some two million Soviet subjects to the Soviet Union. Among these were tens of thousands who had fought with the Germans against Stalin, under the sponsorship of General Vilasov and his Russian Army of Liberation. This is what Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote, in the Gulag Archipelago. In their own country, Roosevelt and Churchill are honored as embodiments of statesmanlike wisdom. To us, in our Russian prison conversations, their consistent short-sightedness and stupidity stood out as astonishingly obvious, what was the military or political sense in their surrendering to destruction at Stalin's hands hundreds of thousands of armed Soviet citizens determined not to surrender. 146. Most shameful of all was the handing over of the Cossacks. They had never been Soviet citizens, since they had fought against the Red Army in the Civil War and then emigrated. Stalin, understandably, was particularly keen to get hold of them, and the British obliged. Solzhenitsyn wrote, of Winston Churchill. He turned over to the Soviet command the Cossack Corps of 90,000 men. Along with them he also handed over many wagon loads of old people, women, and children. This great hero, monuments to whom will in time cover all England, ordered that they, too, be surrendered to their deaths. 147. The purge of alleged collaborators in France was a bloodbath that claimed more victims than the reign of terror in the Great Revolution and not just among those who in one way or other had aided the Germans, included were any right-wingers the communist resistance groups wished to liquidate. 148. The massacres carried out by Churchill's protégé, Tito, must be added to this list, tens of thousands of Croats, not simply the Ustasha, but any class enemies, in classical communist style. There was also the murder of some 20,000 Slovene anti-communist fighters by Tito and his killing squads. When Tito's partisans rampaged in Trieste, which he was attempting to grab in 1945, additional thousands of Italian anti-communists were massacred. As the troops of Churchill's Soviet ally swept through Central Europe and the Balkans, the mass deportations began. Some in the British government had qualms, feeling a certain responsibility. Churchill would have none of it. In January, 1945, for instance, he noted to the Foreign Office, why are we making a fuss about the Russian deportations in Romania of Saxons, Germans and others? I cannot see the Russians are wrong in making 100 or 150,000 of these people work their passage. I cannot myself consider that it is wrong of the Russians to take Romanians of any origin they like to work in the Russian coal fields 150 about 500,000 German civilians were deported to work in Soviet Russia, in accordance with Churchill and Roosevelt's agreement at Yalta that such slave labor constituted a proper form of reparations. Worst of all was the expulsion of some 15 million Germans from their ancestral homelands in East and West Prussia, Silesia, Pomerania and the Sudetenland. This was done pursuant to the agreements at Tehran, where Churchill proposed that Poland be moved west, and to Churchill's acquiescence in the Czech leader Eduard Benes's plan for the ethnic cleansing of Bohemia and Moravia. Around one and a half to two million German civilians died in this process. As the Hungarian liberal Gaspar Thomas wrote, in driving out the Germans of East Central Europe, whose ancestors built our cathedrals, monasteries, universities, and railroad stations, a whole ancient culture was effaced. But why should that mean anything to the Churchill devotees who call themselves conservatives in America today? Then, to top it all, came the Nuremberg Trials, a travesty of justice condemned by the great Senator Robert Taft, 
where Stalin's judges and prosecutors seasoned veterans of the purges of the 30s participated in another great show trial. 154. By 1946, Churchill was complaining in a voice of outrage of the happenings in Eastern Europe, from Stettin on the Baltic to Trieste on the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended over Europe. Goebbels had popularized the phrase Iron Curtain, but it was accurate enough. The European continent now contained a single, hegemonic power. As the blinkers of war were removed, John Charmiley writes, Churchill began to perceive the magnitude of the mistake which had been made. In fact, Churchill's own expressions of profound self-doubt consort oddly with his admirer's retrospective triumphalism. After the war, he told Robert Boothby, historians are apt to judge war ministers less by the victories achieved under their direction than by the political results which flowed from them. Judged by that standard, I am not sure that I shall be held to have done very well. In the preface to the first volume of his History of World War II, Churchill explained why he was so troubled. The human tragedy reaches its climax in the fact that after all the exertions and sacrifices of hundreds of millions of people and of the victories of the righteous cause, we have still not found peace or security, and that we lie in the grip of even worse perils than those we have surmounted. 157. On VE Day, he had announced the victory of the cause of freedom in every land. But to his private secretary, he mused, what will lie between the white snows of Russia and the white cliffs of Dover? It was a bit late to raise the question. Really, what are we to make of a statesman who for years ignored the fact that the extinction of Germany as a power in Europe entailed, certain consequences? Is this another Bismarck or Metternich we are dealing with here? Or is it a case of a Woodrow Wilson redivivus of another Prince of Fools? With the balance of power in Europe wrecked by his own policy, there was only one recourse open to Churchill, to bring America into Europe permanently. Thus, his anxious expostulations to the Americans, including his Fulton, Missouri Iron Curtain speech. Having destroyed Germany as the natural balance to Russia on the continent, he was now forced to try to embroil the United States in yet another war this time a Cold War, that would last 45 years and change America fundamentally, and perhaps irrevocably. 159. The Triumph of the Welfare State In 1945, general elections were held in Britain, and the Labour Party won a landslide victory. Clement Attlee, and his colleagues took power and created the socialist welfare state. But the socialising of Britain was probably inevitable, given the war. It was a natural outgrowth of the wartime sense of solidarity and collectivist emotion, of the feeling that the experience of war had somehow rendered class structure and hierarchy normal features of any advanced society obsolete and indecent. And there was a second factor British society had already been to a large extent socialised in the war years, under Churchill himself. As Ludwig von Mises wrote, Marching ever further on the way of interventionism, first Germany, then Great Britain and many other European countries have adopted central planning, the Hindenburg pattern of socialism. It is noteworthy that in Germany the deciding measures were not resorted to by the Nazis, but sometime before Hitler seized power by Brüning, and in Great Britain not by the Labour Party but by the Tory Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill. 160. While Churchill waged war, he allowed Attlee to head various cabinet committees on domestic policy and devise proposals on health unemployment, education, etc. Churchill himself had already accepted the master blueprint for the welfare state, the Beveridge Report. As he put it in a radio speech, You must rank me and my colleagues as strong partisans of national compulsory insurance for all classes for all purposes from the cradle to the grave. 162. That Mises was correct in his judgment on Churchill's role is indicated by the conclusion of W. H. Greenleaf in his monumental study of individualism and collectivism in modern Britain. Greenleaf states that it was Churchill who, during the war years, instructed R. A. Butler to improve the education of the people and who accepted and sponsored the idea of a four-year plan for national development and the commitment to sustain full employment in the post-war period. As well he approved proposals to establish a national insurance scheme, services for housing and health and was prepared to accept a broadening field of state enterprises. 
It was because of this coalition policy that Enoch Powell referred to the veritable social revolution which occurred in the years 1942-44. Aims of this kind were embodied in the conservative declaration of policy issued by the Premier before the 1945 election. When the Tories returned to power in 1951, Churchill chose a government which was the least recognizably conservative in history. There was no attempt to roll back the welfare state and the only industry that was really reprivatized was road haulage. Churchill left the core of its the Labour government's work inviolate. The conservative victory functioned like Republican victories in the United States, from Eisenhower on to consolidate socialism. Churchill even undertook to make up for deficiencies in the welfare programs of the previous Labour government in housing and public works. Most insidiously of all, he directed his leftist Labour minister, Walter Monckton, to appease the unions at all costs. Churchill's surrender to the unions, dictated by sheer political expediency, set the stage for the quagmire in labor relations that prevailed in Britain for the next two decades. 168. Yet, in truth, Churchill never cared a great deal about domestic affairs, even welfareism, except as a means of attaining and keeping office. What he loved was power and the opportunities power provided to live a life of drama and struggle and endless war. There is a way of looking at Winston Churchill that is very tempting, that he was a deeply flawed creature, who was summoned at a critical moment to do battle with a uniquely appalling evil, and whose very flaws contributed to a glorious victory in a way, like Merlin, in C.S. Lewis's great Christian novel, That Hideous Strength. Such a judgment would, I believe, be superficial. A candid examination of his career, I suggest, yields a different conclusion, that, when all is said and done, Winston Churchill was a man of blood and a politico without principle, whose apotheosis serves to corrupt every standard of honesty and morality in politics and history. This essay, which originally appears in The Costs of War, America's Pyrrhic Victories, is respectfully dedicated to the memory of Henry Regnery, who was, of course, not responsible for its content. The Real Churchill by Adam Young Published at the Mises Institute on February 27, 2004 On February 4, President Bush eulogized the life of Winston Churchill. The President described Winston Churchill as a great man and quickly zeroed in on the mistress that both Bush and Churchill share, war. He was a prisoner in the Boer War a controversial strategist in the Great War. He was the rallying voice of the Second World War, and a prophet of the Cold War. Indeed, there doesn't seem to have been a war or an opportunity for war that Churchill wasn't associated with during his long career. Bush also recited Churchill's famous retort that history will be kind to me, for I intend to write it adding that history has been kind to Winston Churchill, as it usually is to those who help save the world surely hoping that history will be kind to George W. Bush. Except this history is a myth. The truth about the real Churchill The Churchill that few know is that he was a man of the state, of the welfare state and of the warfare state in Professor Ralph Rayako's turn of phrase. The truth about Winston Churchill is that he was a menace to liberty, and a disaster for Britain, for Europe, for the United States of America, and for Western civilization itself. Not since fictional personages like Hercules and Zeus, have so many myths been attached to one man. As we will see, the Winston Churchill we're told about is not the Churchill known to honest history, but rather a fictional version of the man and his actions. And these words and actions have produced our mainstream patriotic political myths as John Denson calls them, which are merely the victor's wartime lies and propaganda scripted into the official history. The Churchill mythology is challenged by honest history, and the reality about Churchill involves hard, but necessary truths. Churchill the Opportunist Of course, central to the neocon mythology built up around their almost deified idealization of Churchill is that he fought for, in Bush's words comparing Tony Blair to Churchill, the right thing, and not the easy thing, right over popularity, principle over opportunism. Except that isn't true. Churchill was above all a man who craved power, and a man who craves power, craves opportunity to advance himself no matter what the cost. When Churchill entered politics, 
many took note of his unique rhetorical talents, which gave him power over men, but it also came with a powerful failing of its own. During World War II, Robert Menzies, the Prime Minister of Australia, noted of Churchill his real tyrant is the glittering phrase so attractive to his mind that awkward facts have to give way. However, Churchill had other failings as well. The Spectator newspaper said of Churchill upon his appointment as First Lord of the Admiralty in 1911, we cannot detect in his career any principles or even any constant outlook upon public affairs, his ear is always to the ground, he is the true demagogue. The great English classical liberal John Morley, after working with Churchill, passed a succinct appraisal of him, Winston, he said, has no principles. Entering politics in 1900, Churchill, the grandson of a duke and son of a prominent Tory, naturally joined the governing Conservative Party. Then in 1904, he left the Conservatives and joined the Liberal Party, and when they were in decline Churchill dumped them and rejoined the Conservatives, uttering his famous quote It's one thing to rat, it's another to re-rat. Churchill allegedly made his move to the Liberals on the issue of free trade. However, Robert Rhodes James, a Churchill admirer, wrote, it was believed at the time, probably rightly, that if Arthur Balfour had given him office in 1902, Churchill would not have developed such a burning interest in free trade and joined the Liberals. Clive Ponting also notes that he had already admitted to Rosebery, he was looking for an excuse to defect from a party that seemed reluctant to recognize his talents. Since the Liberals would not accept a protectionist, Churchill had to change his tune. It's not a surprise that this neoconservative administration and its apologists in the tamed media lot and venerate Churchill, for he was as President Bush described him, a man who was synonymous with war. Churchill loved war. In 1925, he wrote, The story of the human race is war. This is untrue, but Churchill lacked any grasp of the fundamentals of true, classical liberalism. The story of the human race is increasing peaceful cooperation and the efforts by some to stop it through war. However, for Churchill, periods without war offered nothing but the bland skies of peace and platitude. Without principles or scruples, Churchill as a prominent member of the Liberal Party government naturally played a role in the hijacking of liberalism from its roots in individualism, laissez-faire, free trade and bourgeois morality to its transformation into the new liberalism as a proxy for socialism and the omnipotent state in Britain and in America. Churchill was also a famous opponent of communism and of Bolshevism in particular. One of the reasons why Churchill admired Italian fascism was Churchill believed that Mussolini had found a formula that would neutralize the appeal of communism, namely supranationalism with a social welfareist appeal. This is a domestic formula for power that still appeals today if the Bush administration is any indication. Churchill went so far as to say that fascism proved the necessary antidote to the communist poison. Then came 1941. Churchill made his peace with communism. Temporarily, of course. Churchill gave unconditional support to Stalin, welcoming him as an ally, even embracing him as a friend, and calling the breaker of nations, Uncle Joe. In his single-minded obsession with destroying German National Socialism, while establishing his own British National Socialism, and carrying on his pre-World War I British imperialist vendetta to destroy Germany, Churchill completely failed to consider the danger of inviting Soviet power and communism into the heart of Europe. Of course, his self-created mythology chiefly through his own books states that he sensed the danger and tried to warn Roosevelt about Stalin, but the records of the time do not prove this out. In fact, Churchill's infatuation with Stalin reached the point where at the Tehran Conference in November 1943, Churchill presented Stalin with a crusader's sword, Stalin, who had murdered millions of Christians, was now presented by Churchill as a defender of the Christian West. But if one was to sum up Churchill's passion, his overall reason for entering politics, it was the empire. The British Empire was Churchill's abiding love. He fought to expand it, he defended it, and he created his decades-long hatred of Germany because of it. The empire was at the center of his view of the world. Even as late as 1947, Churchill opposed Indian independence. 
When Lord Irwin urged him to bring his views on India up to date by talking to some Indians Churchill replied I am quite satisfied with my views on India, and I don't want them disturbed by any bloody Indians. So much for democracy. Churchill the Socialist Churchill made a name for himself as an opponent of socialism both before and after the First World War, except during the war when he was a staunch promoter of war socialism, declaring in a speech, our whole nation must be organized, must be socialized if you like the word. Of course, such rank hypocrisy was by now Churchill's stock in trade, and not surprisingly, during the 1945 election, Churchill described his partners in the National Unity Government, the Labour Party, as totalitarians, when it was Churchill himself who had accepted the infamous Beveridge Report that laid the foundations for the post-war welfare state and Keynesian, Miss, management of the economy. As Mises wrote in 1950, it is noteworthy to remember that British socialism was not an achievement of Mr. Attlee's Labour government, but of the war cabinet of Mr. Winston Churchill. Churchill was converted to the Bismarckian model of social insurance following a visit to Germany. As Churchill told his constituents, my heart was filled with admiration of the patient genius which had added these social bulwarks to the many glories of the German race. He set out, in his words, to thrust a big slice of Bismarckianism over the whole underside of our industrial system. In 1908, Churchill announced in a speech in Dundee, I am on the side of those who think that a greater collective sentiment should be introduced into the state and the municipalities. I should like to see the state undertaking new functions. Churchill even said, I go farther, I should like to see the state embark on various novel and adventurous experiments. Churchill claimed that the cause of the Liberal Party is the cause of the left-out millions, and attacked the Conservatives as the party of the rich against the poor, the classes and their dependence against the masses, of the lucky, the wealthy, the happy, and the strong, against the left-out and the shut-out millions of the weak and poor. Churchill berated the Conservatives for lacking even a single plan of social reform or reconstruction, while boasting that his new liberalism offered a wide, comprehensive, interdependent scheme of social organization, incorporating a massive series of legislative proposals and administrative acts. Churchill had fallen under the spell of the Fabian Society, and its leaders Beatrice and Sidney Webb, who more than any other group, are responsible for the decline of British society. Here he was introduced to William, later Lord Beveridge, who Churchill brought into the Board of Trade as his advisor on social questions. Besides pushing for a variety of social insurance schemes, Churchill created the system of national labor exchanges, stating the need to spread a sort of Germanized network of state intervention and regulation over the British labor market. Churchill even entertained a more ambitious goal for the Board of Trade. He proposed a plan whereby the Board of Trade would act as the Economic Intelligence Department of the government, forecasting trade and employment in Britain so that the government could spend money in the most deserving areas. Controlling this pork would be a committee of national organization to plan the economy. Churchill was well aware of the electoral potential of organized labor, so naturally Churchill became a champion of the labor unions. He was a leading supporter of the Trades Disputes Act of 1906 which reversed the judicial decisions which had held unions responsible for property damage and injuries committed by their agents on the union's behalf, in effect granting unions a privileged position exempting them from the ordinary law of the land. It is ironic that the immense power of the British labor unions that made Britain the sick man of Europe for two generations and became the foil of Margaret Thatcher, originated with the enthusiastic help of her hero, Winston Churchill. We can only conclude by Churchill's actions that personal freedom was the furthest thing from his mind. Churchill and the First World War The Great War destroyed European culture and the commitment to truths. In their place, generations embraced relativism, nihilism, and socialism, and from the ashes arose Lenin, Stalin, and Hitler and their evil doctrines that infect contemporary culture. In the words of the British historian, Neal Ferguson, the First World War was nothing less than the greatest error in modern history. In 1911, Churchill became First Lord of the Admiralty, and, during the crises that followed, used every opportunity to fan the flames of war. When the final crisis came, in 1914, 
Churchill was all smiles and was the only cabinet member who backed war from the start. Asquith, his own prime minister, wrote, Winston very bellicose and demanding immediate mobilization has got all his war paint on. Churchill was instrumental in establishing the illegal starvation blockade of Germany. The blockade depended on scattering mines, and classified as contraband food for civilians. But, throughout his career, international law and the conventions created to limit the horrors of war meant nothing to Churchill. One of the consequences of the hunger blockade was that, while it killed 750,000 German civilians by hunger and malnutrition, the youth who survived went on to become the most fanatical Nazis. The Lusitania whether Churchill actually arranged for the sinking of the Lusitania on May 7, 1915, is still unclear, but it is clear that he did everything possible to ensure that innocent Americans would be killed by German attempts to break the hunger blockade. A week before the disaster, Churchill wrote to Walter Runciman, president of the Board of Trade that it was most important to attract neutral shipping to our shores, in the hopes especially of embroiling the United States with Germany. The Lusitania was a civilian passenger liner loaded with munitions. Earlier, Churchill had ordered the captains of merchant ships, including liners, to ram German submarines, and the Germans were aware of this. The German government even took out newspaper ads in New York warning Americans not to board the ship. Churchill, by helping engineer the entry of the United States into the Great War, set in motion the transformation of the war into a democratic jihad. Wilsonianism lead to the eventual destruction of the Austrian Empire, and the creation of a vast power vacuum on Germany's southeastern border that would provide fruitful opportunities and allies for Hitler's effort to overturn the Versailles Treaty. But Churchill was not a strategist. All he cared for, as he told a visitor after his Gallipoli disaster, was the waging of war, the defeat of the Germans. Churchill between the wars. Churchill who had been appointed colonial secretary, invented two client kingdoms, Transjordan and Iraq, both artificial and unstable states. Churchill's aim of course was not liberty for oppressed peoples, as his admirers liked to claim for him, but for Britain to dominate the Middle East to ensure that the oil wells of Iraq and the Persian Gulf were securely in British hands. The Crash of 1929 In 1924, Churchill rejoined the Conservative Party and was made Chancellor of the Exchequer, where he returned Britain to the gold standard but didn't account for the British government's wartime inflation, which consequently severely damaged exports and ruined the good name of gold. But, of course, Churchill cared nothing for economic ideas. What interested him was only that the pound would be as strong as in the days of Queen Victoria, that once more the pound would look the dollar in the face. The consequences of this decision had a far-reaching and disastrous impact on Western civilization and the consequent appeal of socialism, Nazism, and communism, the crash of 1929. It was Churchill's unrealistic exchange ratio that caused the Bank of England and the U.S. Federal Reserve to collude to prop up the pound by inflating the U.S. dollar, which in turn fueled the speculative boom during the 1920s that collapsed when the inflating slowed. Churchill's fame and his mythology originates during the period of the 30s, especially for neoconservatives, for whom it is always 1938. However, Churchill's hard line against Hitler was little different from his usual warnings about pre-war Imperial Germany, and his hard line against interwar Weimar Germany. For Churchill saw Germany at all times and in all ways as a threat to the British Empire. A threat that had to be destroyed and forever kept under heel. For instance, Churchill denounced all calls for Allied disarmament even before Hitler came to power. Churchill, like Clemenceau, Wilson, and other Allied leaders, held the unrealistic belief that a defeated Germany would submit forever to the shackles of Versailles. And what the neocons forget, or don't know, is that Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin acknowledged in the House of Commons that, had they told the people the truth, the Conservatives could never have won the 1936 election. Supposing that I had gone to the country and said that Germany was rearming and that we must be armed, does anyone think that our Pacific democracy would have rallied to that cry? It was Neville Chamberlain who began the rearmament of Britain after the Munich crisis, the arms which Churchill would not have had during the Battle of Britain, including the first deployment of radar, 
which Churchill mocked while in opposition in the 1930s. Moreover, Churchill's Cassandra-like role during the 30s emerged largely because Churchill moved from one impending threat to the next, Bolshevik Russia, the general strike of 1926, the dangers of Indian independence, the abdication crisis in 1936. During the 30s Churchill was the proverbial boy who cried wolf. Maybe his neocon admirers could have learned that lesson about Iraq. But as in all things, even with this Churchill reversed himself. In the fall of 1937, he stated. Three or four years ago I was myself a loud alarmist. In spite of the risks which wait on prophecy, I declare my belief that a major war is not imminent, and I still believe that there is a good chance of no major war taking place in our lifetime. I will not pretend that, if I had to choose between communism and Nazism, I would choose communism. And in his book Step by Step written in 1937, Churchill had this to say about the mortal enemy, dot one may dislike Hitler's system and yet admire his patriotic achievement. If our country were defeated, I hope we should find a champion as indomitable to restore our courage and lead us back to our place among the nations. One has to wonder if Churchill was referring to himself in his hypothetical example. The common mythology is so far from historical truth that even an ardent Churchill sympathizer, Gordon Craig, felt obliged to write. It is reasonably well known today that Churchill was often ill-informed, that his claims about German strength were exaggerated and his prescriptions impractical, that his emphasis on air power was misplaced. Moreover, as a British historian noted, for the record, it is worth recalling that in the 1930s Churchill did not oppose the appeasement of either Italy or Japan. Churchill in the Second World War After Munich Chamberlain was determined that Hitler would have no more easy victories, and when Germany invaded Poland in September 1939, Britain declared war on Germany, and Churchill was recalled to his old place as First Lord of the Admiralty. An astonishing thing then happened, the President of the United States bypassed all the ordinary diplomatic channels and initiated a personal correspondence, not with the Prime Minister, but with Churchill. These messages were surrounded by a frantic secrecy, and culminated in the imprisonment of Tyler Kent, the American cipher clerk at the U.S. Embassy in London. Some of these messages contained allusions to FDR's agreement prior to the war to an alliance with Britain, contrary to his public statements and American law. Three months prior to the war, Roosevelt told King George VI that he intended to set up a zone in the Atlantic to be patrolled by the U.S. Navy, and, According to the King's notes, the President stated that if he saw a U-boat he would sink her at once and wait for the consequences. The biographer of George VI, John W. Wheeler Bennett, considered that these conversations contained the germ of the future basis for destroyers deal, and also of the Lend-Lease Agreement itself. In 1940, Churchill at last became Prime Minister. Ironically enough when the Chamberlain government resigned over Churchill's aborted plan to preemptively invade Norway. After France's armed forces were destroyed by the Blitzkrieg. The British army fled towards the Channel, Churchill the conservative, the anti-socialist, defiled the common law by passing totalitarian legislation placing all persons, their services and their property at the disposal of the Crown, i.e., into the hands of Churchill himself. During the Battle of Britain, Churchill gave perhaps his most famous speech, in which he plagiarized the French Premier Georges Clemenceau, and where he uttered his famous phrase If the British Empire and its Commonwealth lasts for a thousand years, men will say, this was their finest hour. This calls to mind another man's boast about a thousand-year Reich. Churchill also hinted at his plot to drag America into the war, dot we shall never surrender, and even if this island were subjugated then our empire beyond the seas armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle, until, in God's good time, the New World, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. But like Marxist revolutionaries, Christian millennialists and other assorted cranks, Churchill was not at all interested in God's good time or any other presumed unearthly schedule, and he worked night and day to collude with Roosevelt to get America into the war. As PM, Churchill continued his policy to refuse any negotiated peace. Even after the fall of France, 
Churchill rejected Hitler's renewed peace overtures. This, however, more than anything else, is supposed to be the foundation of his greatness. Yet what opportunities were lost to a free France and Britain and the Low Countries before 1940 to rearm and negotiate military defence strategies? What of the time lost that could have been used to study the Blitzkrieg method of warfare before it crashed through France? The British historian John Charmiley made the crucial point that Churchill's adamant refusal even to listen to peace proposals in 1940 doomed what he claimed was most dear to him, the empire and a Britain that was non-socialist and independent in world affairs. One could add that by allowing Germany to overrun its weaker neighbours when peace was possible it probably also doomed European Jewry as well. How many more millions of Jews and other Europeans were murdered because of Churchill's stupidity? But it is politically incorrect, and even possibly a hate crime to suggest that better alternatives were available during World War II than those made by the Allies. Just because something turned out one way does not mean that was the only way it could have turned out or was the best result. Somehow, it is controversial to say this. The peace camp realized something that escaped Churchill the empire romanticist, even the British Empire and her vast resources alone could not defeat the concentrated power that Germany possessed in Europe. And even more after the fall of France, Churchill's war aim of total victory could be realized only by embroiling the United States in another world war. As an aside to the French haters, what they forget is that, if the US Army had met the Wehrmacht in 1940, it would have fared considerably worse than the French army. National chauvinists, however, prefer their petty hatreds. Involving America was Churchill's policy in World War II, just as it was Churchill's policy in World War I, and would be his policy again in the Cold War. Churchill put his heart and soul into ensuring Roosevelt came through. In 1940, Churchill sent British agent Intrepid to the United States, where he set up shop in Rockefeller Center, where, with the full knowledge and cooperation of Roosevelt and the collaboration of federal agencies, Intrepid and his 300 agents intercepted mail, tapped wires, cracked safes, kidnapped, rumor-mongered and incessantly smeared their favorite targets, the isolationists, i.e., Jeffersonians, as Nazis and fascists. In June 1941, Churchill, looking for a chance to bring America into the war, wrote regarding the German warship, Prince Eugen, it would be better for instance that she should be located by a US ship as this might tempt her to fire on that ship, thus providing the incident for which the US government would be so grateful. Churchill also instructed the British ambassador to Tokyo, Sir Robert Craigie, the entry of the United States into war either with Germany and Italy or with Japan is fully conformable with British interests. Nothing in the munitions sphere can compare with the importance of the British Empire and the United States being CO belligerent. In August 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill met at the Atlantic Conference. Churchill told his cabinet the president had said he would wage war but not declare it and that he would become more and more provocative. If the Germans did not like it, they could attack American forces. Everything was to be done to force an incident. After the U.S. had officially entered the war, on February 15, 1942, in the House of Commons, Churchill declared, of America's entry into the war, this is what I have dreamed of, aimed at, worked for, and now it has come to pass. This deceptive alliance illustrates another of Churchill's faults. His subordination of political aims to military planning. Churchill made war for the sake of making war, with little regard for the political results that follow. He once even told Asquith that his life's ambition was to command great victorious armies in battle. And World War II was his opportunity. Churchill and Roosevelt were both willing to do anything to destroy the menace of Nazi Germany, at a time when Hitler had killed perhaps several hundred thousand, and to do so they would ally with Hitler's former ally in the invasion of Poland, Joseph Stalin. The Soviet Union had even been invited to join the Axis in 1940, who had already murdered tens of millions. But why is it conventional wisdom that compromise with one dictator at a vital period would have been immoral while collaboration with an even greater dictator with genuine global ambitions was the mark of greatness? The truth is Churchill cared for nothing but Britain. The lives, homes, and cultures of non-Britons he took and destroyed without a care or second thought. 
what sort of conservatism requires the murder of millions of defenseless innocents? Winston Churchill was a man who along with Roosevelt, Hitler, and Stalin, probed just how far Western civilization could fall in just six short years of time. Churchill threw British support to the communist partisan leader Tito. What a victory for Tito would mean was no secret to Churchill. When an aide pointed out that Tito intended to transform Yugoslavia into a communist dictatorship on the Stalinist model, Churchill retorted, Do you intend to live there? What a humanitarian! Of course, in Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt were confronted with a man who had an overall political aim for the war. Stalin knew what he wanted to achieve from the destruction of Germany. For Churchill, his only aim was to beat Hitler, and then he would start thinking of the future of Britain and Europe. Churchill said it in so many words, it was to be the defeat, ruin, and slaughter of Hitler, to the exclusion of all other purposes, loyalties, and aims. Churchill's aim was in his words, the indefinite prevention of there the Germans rising again as an armed power. Not surprisingly, instead of making every effort to encourage and assist the anti-Nazi resistance groups in Germany, Churchill responded to the feelers sent out by the German resistance with silence, thus helping to prolong the war and the killing. Even more shockingly, Churchill had nothing but scorn for the heroic officers after their failed assassination attempt on Hitler in July 1944, even as Hitler was enjoying their filmed executions. In the place of help, Churchill only offered Germans the slogan of unconditional surrender, which only prolonged the war further. And instead of promoting the overthrow of Hitler by anti-Nazi Germans, Churchill's policy was all-out support of Stalin. Returning from Yalta, Churchill told the House of Commons on February 27, 1945 that he did not know any government that kept its obligations as faithfully as did the Soviet Union, even to its disadvantage. The War Crimes That Churchill committed war crimes planned them, aided and abetted them, and defended them is beyond doubt. Churchill was the prime subverter through two world wars of the rules of warfare that had evolved in the West over centuries. At the Quebec Conference, Roosevelt and Churchill adopted the Morgenthau Plan, which if implemented would have killed tens of millions of Germans, giving the Germans a terrifying picture of what unconditional surrender would mean in practice. Churchill was convinced of the plan's benefits, as it would save Britain from bankruptcy by eliminating a dangerous competitor. That the Morgenthau Plan was analogous to Hitler's post-conquest plans for Western Russia and the Ukraine was lost on Churchill, who according to Morgenthau, drafted the wording of the scheme. Churchill even brainstormed dropping tens of thousands of anthrax super bombs on the civilian population of Germany, and ordered detailed planning for a chemical attack on six major cities, estimating that millions would die immediately by inhalation, with millions more succumbing later. But Churchill's greatest war crimes involved the terror bombing of German cities that killed 600,000 civilians and left some 800,000 injured. Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris, the head of Bomber Command, stated in Bomber Command we have always worked on the assumption that bombing anything in Germany is better than bombing nothing. Churchill brazenly lied to the House of Commons and the public, claiming that only military and industrial installations were targeted. In fact, the aim was to kill as many civilians as possible. Hence the application of carpet bombing in an attempt to terrorize the Germans into surrendering. Professor Rayako described the effect of Chakilian statesmanship, the campaign of murder from the air leveled Germany. A thousand-year-old urban culture was annihilated, as great cities, famed in the annals of science and art, were reduced to heaps of smoldering ruins. No wonder that, learning of this, a civilized European man like Joseph Schumpeter, at Harvard, was driven to telling anyone who would listen that Churchill and Roosevelt were destroying more than Genghis Khan. According to the official history of the Royal Air Force, the destruction of Germany was by then on a scale which might have appalled Attila or Genghis Khan. Dresden was filled with masses of helpless refugees running for their lives ahead of the advancing Red Army. The war was practically over, but for three days and nights, from February 13 to 15, 1945, British bombs pounded Dresden, killing as many as 135,000 people or more in three days. After the massacre, Churchill attempted to disclaim responsibility, 
even casually saying I thought the Americans did it. The terror bombing of Germany and the killing of civilians continued as late as the middle of April, 1945. It only stopped, as Bomber Harris noted, because there were essentially no more targets left to be bombed in Germany. In order to kill a maximum number of Germans, Winston Churchill dismissed politics or policy as a secondary consideration, and on at least two occasions said that there were no lengths of violence to which we would not go in order to achieve his objective. In fact he said this publicly in a speech given on September 31, 1943 and again in the House of Commons, on February 27, 1945, when unbelievable lengths of violence had already taken place. If Hitler had uttered this phrase, we would all cite it as more evidence of his barbarism. Yet, when Churchill utters it, his apologists palm it off as the resoluteness required of a great statesman, rather than describing it as an urge for mass, indiscriminate murder. Of course, Churchill supported the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which resulted in the deaths of another 200,000 civilians. When Truman fabricated the myth of the 500,000 American lives saved to justify his mass murder, Churchill felt the need to top his lie, the atomic bombings had saved 1,200,000 lives, including 1 million Americans. It was all just another of Churchill's fantasies. Yet, after all this slaughter, Churchill would write, the goal of World War II was to revive the status of man. Churchill and the Cold War among Churchill's many war crimes, there are also those crimes and atrocities for which he is culpable that occurred following the war. These include the forced repatriation of some two million old people, men, women, and children to the Soviet Union to their deaths. Then there were the massacres carried out by Churchill's protege, Tito, tens of thousands of Croats, Slovenes and other class enemies and anti-communists were killed. In the wake of the armies of Churchill's friend and ally, the mass deportations began. But Churchill was unmoved. In January 1945 he said, Why are we making a fuss about the Russian deportations in Romania of Saxons, Germans and others? I cannot see the Russians are wrong in making 100 or 150,000 of these people work their passage. I cannot myself consider that it is wrong of the Russians to take Romanians of any origin they like to work in the Russian coal fields. Here Churchill, the great friend of liberty as Bush described him, approves of slavery. About 500,000 German civilians were enslaved to work in Soviet Russia, in accordance with the Yalta Agreement where Churchill and Roosevelt agreed that slave labor constituted a proper form of reparations. Then there was the great atrocity of the expulsion of 15 million Germans from their ancestral homelands in East and West Prussia, Silesia, Pomerania and the Sudetenland pursuant to Churchill's mad plan to violently uproot the entire Polish population and move Poland westward, which he demonstrated with a set of matchsticks, and to Churchill's acceptance of the Czech leader Eduard Benes's plan for the ethnic cleansing of Bohemia and Moravia. Around two million German civilians died in this process. An entire ancient culture was obliterated. This sort of cultural jihad used to be something conservatives opposed. Today's neoconservatives instead who evidently embrace the Marxist doctrine of sweeping away the past, would surely argue that in order to create, one must first destroy, or in that old Stalinist phrase, to make an omelette, you must first break a few eggs. A large factor in the litany of Churchill's war crimes was his racism. Churchill was an English chauvinist, a British racist, and like Wilson, loathed the so-called dirty whites, the French, Italians and other Latins, and Slavs like the Serbs, Poles, Russians, etc. Churchill professed Darwinism, and particularly disliked the Catholic Church and Christian missions. He became, in his own words, a materialist to the tips of my fingers, and fervently upheld the worldview that human life is a struggle for existence, with the outcome the survival of the fittest. In 1919, as Colonial Secretary Churchill advocated the use of chemical weapons on the uncooperative Arabs in the puppet state of Iraq. I do not understand the squeamishness about the use of gas, he declared. I am strongly in favor of using poison gas against uncivilized tribes. Some years later, gassing human beings to death would make other men infamous. 
An example of Churchill's racial views are his comments made in 1937, I do not admit that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, has come in and taken their place. In Churchill's single-minded decades-long obsession with preventing a single hegemonic power from arising on the European continent that would pose a threat to the British Empire, he failed to see that his alliance with Stalin produced exactly that. As the blinkers of war were removed, John Charmiley writes, Churchill began to perceive the magnitude of the mistake which had been made. Churchill is alleged to have blurted out after finally realizing the scale of his blunder, we have slaughtered the wrong pig. But it was too late. For decades Churchill worked for the destruction of Germany. Yet only after Stalin had devoured half of Europe did this great statesman realize that destroying the ability of Germany to act as a counterbalance to Russia left Europe ripe for invasion and conquest by a resurgent Russia. By 1946 Churchill was complaining in a voice of outrage about the Iron Curtain of tyranny that descended on Eastern Europe. But Churchill helped to weave the fabric. With the balance of power in Europe wrecked by his own hand, Churchill saw only one recourse, to bind America to Europe permanently. Thus Churchill returned to his tried-and-true strategy, embroiling the United States in another war. This time a Cold War that would entrench the military-industrial complex and change America forever. Conclusion With his lack of principles and scruples, Churchill was involved in one way or another in nearly every disaster that befell the 20th century. He helped destroy laissez-faire liberalism, he played a role in the crash of 1929, he helped start WWI, and by bringing in America to help, prolonged the war and created the conditions for the rise of Nazism, prolonged World War II, laid the groundwork for Soviet domination, helped involve America in a Cold War with Russia and pioneered in the development of total war and undermining Western civilized standards. Chris Matthews described Churchill as the man who saved D the honor of the 20th century. Rather than this great accolade, Winston Churchill must be ranked with Karl Marx, Woodrow Wilson, Vladimir Lenin, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Herbert Hoover, and Franklin Roosevelt as one of the destroyers of the values and greatness of Western civilization. And it is fitting that the Library of Congress exhibition is entitled Churchill and the Great Republic because few men have done more to overthrow the American Republic, s, and institute the great centralized global war machine that has taken its place.